that thanks um, is working. Expanding in the regions. 
You have about 80,000 anglers fishing for salmon annually, and the economic value of salmon angling is 1.4 billion kroner or 127 million pounds a year. So it's, it's a significant industry, really. Another thing that's different is our beavers were reduced to very low populations, uh, less, than, uh, less than 100, we think. Um, but as soon as the population became capable of supporting them, they became game animals again. This is to do with the you knowledge of culture on, on the use of nature, which is very different from, from that in, in Britain. You can wear them, and you can eat them. Um, with this audience, if I suggested that hunting might be a, a management solution in this country, I am liable to get a pretty negative reaction. But I would like you to at least consider it. It would give the landowner something that they wanted. It would be completely free in its management. And one of the reasons we have very little problem with beavers in Norway is that if the beaver is regarded by the farmer as a problem, because farmers are landowners in Norway, then they can get rid of them without <coughs> consulting anyone are on their own time and expense, and my experience is that they very rarely bother. Beavers are boring to hunt, they don't produce much meat, and we recently stopped using a quota system for them, we could never, never got up to the quota that would we affect the population. So, to beaver dance. Uh, this is a dam at Songley, which some of you know, um, with a small boy for Age. This is the year we built, it's unconsolidated, and that's about 22. <coughs> there it is a few years later, same boy, rather bigger. Uh, it's about five years later, when it reached its maximum size. But you can see, this is after a rainfall in the autumn, and you can see the water is shelving over the top, and uh, no fish have had any trouble getting over that. There it is a bit later in the same year. Then, after about five years of use, it, they stopped maintaining it, and it collapsed pretty, pretty quickly. They've never since built the dam in this territory again, and that's pretty much the usual pattern for the dam. Very few of them are permanent. It did produce this beaver meadow behind the dam. That's it, the year after the dam collapsed. And that's it uh, last autumn. It's now developing into um, a permanent beaver shrubbery, as it were, where the regrowing trees are continually coppiced back. And here's one at Banff, also in winter conditions <coughs> where it's raining, and very typically beaver dams have water running over them and water around them much or most of the time. I should say, this is the biggest dam that I know. I actually was showing some Scottish people this when the farmer arrived with the JCB. So I could tread on top of his back and pull the dam thing down. In fact, what he did was dig this trench. And we had a word with him. He said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, the beavers can do that. But at the moment, they're creating this bog from the way the water's running off, and it will erode things. So he dug that trench, and that uh, this is now five years on, the dam has gotten a lot bigger, but the trench is still operating to remove the beavers. He won, and it turned out, we all worried about this. So to our main subject, SNH begins investigating the possibility of the increase in beavers in 1994. And I, I discovered some faxes from me to Chris Smout in that year, who was the number two in Scottish Natural Heritage, who I knew. So my connection turned to go uh, to right back to the very beginning. 1995, some, but notice not all. There's always this tendency that people who shout loudest and have the strongest opinions and claim to represent the whole interest group may not necessarily do so. It's an easy trap to fall into. But some formally oppose beaver reintroduction on the grounds of alleged negative effects of damming for salmon stocks. And in part, it was on assertions that were made at the time that beavers were a problem for plant salmon stock in Norway. This was stated in their opposition. Which is where I come in, <laughs> on the subject, and the one in the middle. Um, 
I was in Norway, and I arrived there in 1993, probably through my connection with Chris Smout, the questions started coming to me. And because I was from Scotland, I actually spent time answering them, which may have been a mistake. <laughs> so I went off and talked to the people in our salmon department who do most of the salmon research in Norway, including Professor Bruri Johnson, who was the chief fishery researcher at Nina at the time. And all of them said, variations of you what? <laughs> um, so he produced this without me asking him, and I was a letter of him to concern, the, the important section of which was this. Our salmon stocks face many problems, but I've never even heard it mentioned that beavers might be one of them. We do not never consider beaver dams to be a problem for fish stocks in Norway. So, this was transmitted to Scotland. And then in 1997, it was stated in Scotland by the same individuals, in fact, that said that beaver dams were a problem for salmon in Scotland in Norway, um, but beaver do not in fact occur in salmon rivers in Norway. This seems a little incompatible with the previous statements, but let's go with it. So I took a look at that. These are the 10 top salmon rivers in Norway by tonnage of fish extracted per year. Three beavers means beavers have a capacity population on them, one means that there was a relatively small beaver population. So in fact, the overlap is really pretty large. So then we got to 2000. It's then being said that salmon don't spawn on small beavers down the water tributaries in Norway, but only on the main rivers. Because Norwegian rivers differ in topography because of the steep fjord and landscape. The tributary streams are too steep for salmon, only on the main river, Scotland, totally different. The thinking of this, which of course is the image of Norway that most people have, straight off the top. Vertical places, the top one there is the, the uh, Fundalsura River, and indeed the salmon on that river do not spawn inside tributaries because of the topography. That is entirely true. But most of Norway is not fjordland. These are photographs of several different parts of Norway, the uh, southeast in the top left hand corner, middle Norway on the right, and here are landscapes of the seven top ten salmon rivers in Norway which do have large beaver, which do have beaver populations on them. All of them have small tributaries in which salmon spawn, so this, this is a statement which is actually incorrect. So at this point, I thought I'd probably better try and get some primary data on this. There is no funding for this kind of thing in Norway, non-problem on funding. <laughs> um, so I went and took a few holiday days and borrowed some equipment from Nina and a guy who knew how to use it, electric fishing equipment, and we went up to one of these tributaries. You can see the main beaver dam in this tributary. It's point one hundred meters high, it's a solid dam, and there were three dams on this tributary which runs into the river and it has salmon on it. The place is called the Little Elba, or Little River, and it had, sorry, four beaver dams over a distance of 600 meters, one meter, half a meter, half a meter, and 1.6 meters high, in order from downstream to upstream. We used the usual standard electrofishing techniques, and we found Zero plus, that means hatch that year, and one plus age class salmon and trout below, between, and above all the dams. But strongly suggested spawning female salmon were able to cross all four dams in both of those years. It's a minor possibility that perhaps the juvenile stage salmon swam upstream to occupy above dam reach. That doesn't seem very likely, but it's, it's, it's a, a hypothesis. And then you looked at the number of salmon and trout of each age class collected each sampling location. And to summarize it, we found the salmon and trout one plus year downstream of all dams significantly larger than those collected upstream of all dams. Most likely that's because of the effect of the dam of biological productivity running down and being eaten by the fish from the dam. 
zero plus salmon collected within the dam series were larger than those collected below all dams. Now this was very much a pilot piece of work. And I tried to use it to get further funding, but there's just no interest in funding this kind of research in Scotland, in Norway, or uh, getting it funded in Scotland if it were outside Scotland. Um, it is a problem with Scottish funding, since I'm on camera, that you won't fund anything outside your own country, no matter how happens it, this is very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on, and taking this chronologically, here we are in 2002. This is the Orkla River, which is quite near where I live. Um, down left here, this is coming at the air in my Bobby Beaver work. These are the centres of beaver territories on the Aukla watershed itself, which is the greener area here, the other ones are outside the watershed. There are beavers up there too, but I wasn't able to survey it. So it's got a lot of beavers. This is the same place, it's a glen with lowish hills that, that certainly both beavers and salmon can swim up. Uh, it looks a lot like Scottish rivers, the rocks of Caledonia and Orochini, it's the exact same rocks as in Scotland. So, this place is a national reference watershed for studies, in other words, an awful lot of research was done there, mostly by my colleagues at Nina, uh, in the period 1979 to 2002. It summarised 23 years of intensive research in, on the watershed on the subject of population regulating factors in Atlantic salmon. Mentions of beaver, zero. <laughs> Not in the entire document, even though there are a lot of beavers there. There is a management plan for beavers on the Aukla, because they are game animals, developed by the <coughs> council, and it's worked at the level of the individual colony. Now, by this time, some of the things from Scotland were making their way through into uh, Norway, and I think part of that's why they actually addressed this issue. This is the only thing I've found, in fact, that has. Um, three sentences in Beaver, Sam, and Sea Trout, stating that while occasionally suggested dams are potentially in their migration, there is no evidence of here or elsewhere in Norway. So then it's the Nansen watershed, also in Trondelac. This is a, a big river. It's usually the second biggest by hatchway, second or fifth in Norway. In its lower reaches, it runs through very flat land, meanders a great deal. And it got quite a lot of big salmon. Those few pictures at the bottom were all the season in 20, uh, 2019. Um, Beaver colonized the rivers in the late 70s, and the population's capacity for the last 20 years. Hunting is quota free, but no bank limit, because the interest in hunting beavers is so low that it never had any impact on the population. This is what it looks like divided up into fishing beats. It's uh, a big money earner locally, and, and the entire place is, is chopped up into salmon fishing beats. It also has an examination of how to do salmon river it is. It's up at the top, on uh, a scale of 1 to 5, one being extinct. It's at 5. 5A for salmon is the best rate in the hall. No real problems at all. Sea trout are 5B, but that B is because of flow regulation for hydropower. So again, no perception here that beavers have any impact on any of these populations. And you put together bits of data that come from different places. The, the lower commune here, local government district, actually did a survey of beavers for its own reasons, nothing to do with salmon. Those are the red dots there, those are, are the lodges that are the centres of territories. <coughs> There's also a lot of salmon spawning stations, where spawning of salmon is measured every year. Um, so they are checking the spawning every year in a number of sites, like that one there, which are on small streams, which have got beavers on them. And they produce reports like this one, which translates as um, spawning and young fish of salmon and trout in the Nansen, North Trondelag, 2006. 
They recalled the salmon and trout fry at all 26 sampling stations, including all the tributaries we sampled. And again, mentions of beaver in this document, zero. Then we get to the nearest old water watershed, which is in South Norway. And there was, in fact, a entire paper written on the potentials for restraining an adverse salmon by a beaver in this place. But it was written specifically in request in, in response to point requirements coming from Scotland. It wouldn't have been written otherwise. It looked at the entire river system, which is ninth in Norway by that way. During the period that the beavers recolonized the watershed, salmon catches actually increased, so I would suggest the cause of effect. Beaver population are carrying capacity since the 90s, and they found the beaver preferred to colonize the same section of tributaries which were used for spawning. But nevertheless, only 15% of the stream length on the 51 tributaries navigable by salmon had been used by beaver. And on the entire river system, there were only five functioning dams. And it mounted to one dam per 14.3 kilometers of tributary. All the dams were low. And then they calculated the potential. If you assume, for the sake of argument, that all dams stopped all fish all the time, then it hindered sea trout and salmon from reaching 18% and 3% respectively, of the potential spawning habitat. Five or 14 landowners had removed beaver dams at least once, 36 years, but never because of perceived hindrance of Solomonis. <coughs> so the overall conclusion was that the potential for beaver dams to restrain an animal of salmon Solomonis reproduction, assuming for the sake of argument that they did in the movement, was low. At uh, the scale of the watershed, this is really not that big a phenomenon. And when you, what you're really talking about here is whether this will affect the number of catchable salmon coming back to the river. And the chances of that is going to be affected in any way you can tell about all of the other factors affecting salmon is so tiny that you can put the negative. One way or the other, it's positive or negative. So in 2009, I did a, an internet survey trying to look outside the scientific literature on this, looked at all the salmon and trout angling blogs and websites for mention of the beavers. And there are a lot of these, a lot of people interested in salmon. I did find exactly one mention of beavers on all of these areas. And it was an angler of the beaver that had been snagged by an angler of his fly. The perception among the angling community of this is it's just not there. I try hard to find it, I just can't find it. 2012, this is from uh, Restoration of Streams for Sea Trout, which is in, in Ostfold province. Ostfold is the area southeast of Oslo. It's there, it's very flat, the, and it's got problems with culverts and so forth, blocking salmon movement. It doesn't mention beavers much, but <coughs> it's up here. If you can't read that, it's translated into English. It says, beavers fell trees which become dead wood in the stream. Um, it also says, insect food live on the dead wood. The dead wood captures growth material which becomes food for various small animals and turn food for fish. And under tree trunk, how trunk can hide from predators. So this has been mentioned in passing, very much in passing, but beavers, as far as they're concerned, yet yeah, find the <coughs> source for some sea trout. And this place has all the usual problems with eutrophication and so on that intensive agricultural areas have. So eventually I did manage to get some research on this done by getting money from the European Union and in you know, writing the proposal we used all of these statements from Scotland uh, because to indicate to the European Union that there was a perception of a problem, and I think that was very useful in getting this funded. Um, it was done by Rachel Madison, who had previously published two well-known papers on the effect of um, salmon on, on, on salmon of beaver damming in a wilderness river in Alaska, where there are thousands of dams on the floodplain, 
and there indeed there is the effect which is reducing the productivity of the place. So this is a lady that had absolutely no axe to grind in Scotland. She looked at the couple of study sites, or a number of study sites, I'm just presenting a couple of examples here. Uh, in Stuart Eldell, where she paired up areas that appeared to be hydrologically similar, one of which had a beaver dam and one which didn't. And another one on the Orkla. And to cut the story short, this is still being written up. Um, the results indicated that despite differences in habitat use, the presence of beaver did not influence the growth or condition of juvenile trout and salmon. Beaver dams and ponds did not block the movement of juvenile fish in either the upstream or downstream direction. And that was done by using detecting equipment that could detect fish moving across the array. Also, as you've heard before, stream systems and dams are constantly changing. Many opportunities for fish moving occur. So overall, we found that there's very little potential for negatively impacting salmon population. And it's worth mentioning this connection that we're talking about river systems that are from Caledonia and the rocks and resemble the two years very, very strongly in their hydrology. So 2019, this is International Salmon Year. And the Norwegian Salmon Owners Association, that's these people, Norse Max Elber, <coughs> business organization for rights owners for angling and watersheds for salmon, sea trout, and sea char. That's their own description of themselves. I saw an advert for this at the airport on the way through it. Big thing. It's a movie. The Wild Salmon, Norway's natural family silver possibilities and threats. Mentions of beaver, just to get familiar, zero. <laughs> and these are the guys who are the exact counterpart of some of the organizations, remember not all in Scotland, who think that there might be a problem. I looked at their website, which is huge, and I searched it, and it's got a search function for beaver. Mentions zero. And these are not people slow to detect the problem. But nevertheless, to jump back slightly, I want to think about the third or fourth iteration. The Scotch Natural Heritage were still asking us the same questions that they asked us 20 years before. And the successor to Brewer, to, um, to the position of top salmon man, Brewer and Forseth, came up entirely independently of the previous statement with a statement saying exactly the same thing. We've got a lot of them, and I quote, I have never had any concerns and complaints related to the interaction <coughs> between and salmon and fishes, an agronomist or resident, and that's the guy who leads the Standing Scientific Committee on Atlantic Salmon Management. This is just a total non-problem with us. And, you know, I wish I could find some new ones. It might make you sound more credible, but there isn't. <laughs> So just before I came here, I did a Google search for beaver salmon in Scotland and beaver black in Norway, which is beaver salmon Norway in Norwegian, to see what I get. I got 1.3 million hits from the Scotland version, <laughs> starting off with the beaver salmon in working group, and every single hit in the top ones there shown is to do with the salmon, beaver salmon issue. Called. Norwegian equivalent. I only got 35,000 hits for that one. Um, the top one is indeed about beaver and salmon, but it's about Rachel looking for dams. <laughs> the rest of them are ones that came up more or less accidentally. There's a one where a beaver bit an unfortunate woman who dived into the river pool that it was living in. I can think she actually landed on top of it. <laughs> 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 Two of them on that. One is on a, a beaver killed by a tree falling on it, which is cut down itself. Uh, the other two are three aspects of the hunting of beaver, and they're on a website that also deals with fishing, a hunting and fishing website, lower down the same page that I mentioned. So, the Norwegian one, there just isn't any mention of this, not on the whole internet. And I asked Rasheen before I came here, how many people work with main employment on beaver management in the UK? And she said she thought about six. In Norway, it's, it's zero. I think this is a hobby. There isn't a single person who works full time on salmon management in the whole of Norway. 
And this is a country where 10 years ago we had more full time gold researchers than gold. <laughs> So, summarized, well, we have exactly the same species of salmonids and the same species of beaver in Scotland. Yeah, similar hydrology and topography for Scotland, so I would say that it's clearly the best parallel. Salmon angling is very significant economically, very many people fish for salmon. Beaver are common in six of the top ten salmon rivers and on lots of others. It's the closest parallel to Scotland. And the simple fact is, for 25 years we have been reporting that there is almost no perception in Norway of beavers being a disadvantage for fish, or a much an advantage either, either in the specialist literature, or in newspapers, websites, or in social media. In some animal farming regions, the recent management advices that beavers can be one element in the for storing seed trout stocks, but it's not a large element. Throughout the repeated Period of repeated investigations, and we've been consistent with approaching this. There is no research on it in Norway, no primary research, because it's one prob problem to get funded. Uh, the pity reply to my initial thing all those years ago from another salmon researcher around the coffee table was, and this is more or less a quote, I might as well study the mallard problem for salmon stock. <laughs> <laughs> So although the assertions in Scotland about the situation have varied radically from that there is a problem, which was the original assertion, through that beaver and salmon don't overlap, to denial that Norwegian river systems are comparable to those in Scotland, all of these have been disproved, all that happens is a new assertion gets made, which leads to the same conclusion. But again, remember this is not all anglers, this is just some of them, but they're the ones that get immediate. That is, all the evidence suggests, in my first computer psychology, incidentally, uh, maintaining the conclusion is what is important to some of these people. Which is a curious phenomenon. It's not so much Holmes and Watson as Drummond's. <laughs> when I first got contacted and said, can you talk about Peter the Salmon? My, my expression resembled that rather closely. It's really movie. My state of mind is pretty similar as well. Um, the management conclusion, we've heard this again and again in this conference so far, stated reasons for opposition to something, like a wildlife initiative, can often be instrumental, that is, they are tools to attack an idea that you dislike for some other reason. Now, it's always necessary to address these reasons, but no lasting solution will be possible unless you identify the best <coughs> underlying issue. This often means wildlife human conflicts are often mainly elements in wider human social conflicts that need to be addressed. And I would suggest, in fact, I would conclude that that is specifically true of the Bean and Salmon issue in Scotland. So if you wish to deal with it, then while dealing with the statements that are made is necessary, until you get to what's in fact at the root of the matter, which is a social problem, it's not going to go away. I expect to give this talk again. <laughs> <laughs>